It's early Sunday morning and you've just woken up with a swollen bladder. But that's no problem because today is going to be another relaxing weekend in paradise. Sure, the papers are sprinkled with some stories about a German army fighting in Russia, but you are a world away on the best posting in the Army Air Corps, Hawaii, and nothing can touch you here. Suddenly, there's a whine of an engine. You look out of the window, toothbrush hanging from your mouth as a bomb leaves an aircraft diving along the parked fighters outside. In the ensuing explosion, you're knocked off your feet. What do you do next? It's December 7, 1941, and the second lieutenant Rasmussen picks himself up from the floor of the Wheeler Field barracks bathroom. He springs into action. Rushing to the flight line, he finds only destruction. The modern P-40 fighters he operates are all burning wrecks. In the corner of the devastation, he sees an old, tired P-36 Hawk sitting untouched amid the flames. Without hesitation, the young fighter pilot rushes towards the obsolete fighter to get airborne and defend his base against the new enemy. A decision which will write him into the history books. Although the exploits of 2nd Lieutenant George S. Welch and 2nd Lieutenant Kenneth M. Taylor are perhaps more well known, being brought to the silver screen in the movie Pearl Harbor, the story of 2nd Lieutenant and Rasmussen is far more interesting in my opinion. Not only did he face the mighty and feared Mitsubishi Zero in a far more obsolete aircraft, he also did it dressed in nothing more than his purple striped pyjamas. I think this shows just how chaotic the events of that morning were, and just how determined these young Americans were to fight back. If you want to learn more about the exploits of Welch and Taylor, I can recommend you watch TJ History's video about them after you watch this story, or you can comment below and ask me to create my own video about them. And if you think this is a story worth spreading, please click the like button. But for now, let's look at what led to a young 23 year old being in an underpowered fighter in his purple pajamas. As every American school child should know, December 7th, 1941, that infamous date, marked the beginning of the Second World War for the United States. However, as President Roosevelt had been publicly battling against America's entry into the Old World's latest conflict, war had been raging across the globe for nearly a decade. The surprise attack on the heart of the US Navy's Pacific home would not come from the Germanic threat in the East but rather from the Empire of Japan, who just two short decades previously had been sitting on the same side of the peace table as the Americans in Versailles. How had these one-time comrades come to blows? The root of the attack on the naval base at Pearl Harbor really has its roots in another body of water, the Yongding, which would become the center of the Marco Polo Bridge incident of 1937. Although Japanese forces had invaded Chinese territory as early as 1931, it was a clash between Japanese and nationalist Chinese soldiers around modern day Beijing, which would really lead to 2nd Lieutenant Rasmussen and others to rush to their aircraft four years later. Following the renewed Japanese expansion into China, the United States imposed severe sanctions on the Empire of Japan in support of Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist Chinese government. By 1941, Japan, a nation which relied heavily on foreign imports for raw materials and fuel, was getting desperate. This was exacerbated when the US imposed further sanctions on oil in response to Japan's annexation of French Indochina. In order to expand into resource-rich territories in the Pacific, the threat of the American warships had to be overcome. How did the Americas not know about the oncoming onslaught? Well, in fact, FDR was well aware that Japan was becoming increasingly hostile towards the United States. In late 1940, US Army crypt analysts had cracked the Japanese diplomatic code in a breakthrough which would become known as MAGIC. MAGIC allowed the Americans to read what Japanese diplomats were telling each other pretty much in real time. 
However, they weren't able to read military messages, so they only had a partial picture of what Japan was planning. Despite efforts to stem the tide of war between Japan and the US right up until minutes before the attack on December 7th, the American government never expected an attack on Pearl Harbor. This naval base was 3,000 miles from Japan and felt like a safe location for the Pacific Fleet. The Philippines, with its large American force led by General MacArthur, seemed the more logical target. In fact, Manila was attacked on December 8th. MacArthur had received full warning from his superiors and still the attack was met with little resistance. And so, Second Lieutenant Erasmussen found himself at the epicenter of one of the most tragic days in US history. Fearing more saboteurs, American planes had been grouped together on airfields, making them perfect targets for the attacking Japanese. This meant that when Erasmussen got outside, most of his squadron of B-40 fighters were burning wrecks. A little distance away from the carnage, a few older fighters were sitting ready for action. The Curtis P-36 Hawk was a fairly modern design when it made its first flight in 1935. It was even tested against the early Mark Spitfires by the British and found to be superior to this celebrated fighter in many aspects. Highly maneuverable and light on the controls at high speeds, the P-36 could have seen a lot of success in the US Army Air Corps, but it was soon overshadowed by the P-40. The main issue was its underpowered engine and poor dive characteristics. However, Rasmussen was about to find out, as many pilots from France and Britain would, that the P-36 Hawk could still hold its own against the enemy. Seeing an unscathed P-36, Rasmussen ran to it and strapped himself in. Being exposed to the open, he had to first taxi the aircraft to a blast pen at the outskirts of the field, where he planned to arm the fighter. This he did with the help of a brave armourer and they managed to fill its 50 and 30 caliber machine guns. Three other pilots, Lou Sanders, the squadron commander, Gordon Sterling and John Thacker, joined Rasmussen in his efforts, and the four P-36s took off under fire and were vectored towards Carneo Hay Bay. In fact, I uncovered a story which says that Sterling actually stole his aircraft from a Lieutenant Norris, who had vacated his plane to swap over his parachute. This is when Sterling jumped behind the controls and hijacked his steed. This tragic moment of fate becomes even more poignant later in our story. When the four aircraft arrived over Kaneahe Bay, they saw Mitsubishi A6M 20s attacking it and dropped on them from above. It was during the initial phases of this dogfight that Rasmussen's task got just that little bit more difficult. In the P-36 Hawk, the pilot had to manually charge his machine guns by pulling a lever to cock the individual guns. As Rasmussen did this, one of his 50 cows started to fire all on its own. To avoid wasting ammo and not shooting down one of his own squadron mates, he had to fly with the charging lever in the back. With the Japanese fighter in his gun sight, Rasmussen released the charging lever and let loose with all his guns. He saw his bullets creep along the enemy's cockpit and the fighter fell away in flames. In some accounts I've read, it's reported that Rasmussen shot down this Zeke by accident, simply because it flew into his stream of bullets. I like to give him a little bit more credit, but that does make for a humorous movie moment. Having just achieved his first victory, and one of the first for American aircrew during World War II, Rasmussen was set upon by another Zero, which, according to his account, tried to ram him. This was later confirmed after the war by the Japanese pilot himself. As Rasmussen pulled up to avoid being hit by this persistent attack, he flew into the bullets of another Japanese fighter. His canopy was shot away and his rudder controls were also severely damaged. Filled with hundreds of bullets, Rasmussen had to drop into a cloud to escape death, later landing back at Wheeler Field. As Rasmussen was engaged with his Zero, his squad mates were also in the thick of the fight. Sanders was the first to destroy Zero, and then tried to latch onto another which was pursuing Sterling, who himself was firing at a second Zero. Rasmussen reported that he saw Sterling's target crash into the bay, 
followed by Sterling's aircraft. Apparently Sterling managed to bail out of his P-36 after it was hit by Japanese fire, but he did not survive. The fourth Hawk, piloted by John Thacker, suffered from a total machine gun jam and he was unable to engage the enemy. Once surviving the landing, which was difficult seeing that his hydraulics had been totally shot away, Rasmussen returned to his barracks and finally took off his pyjamas and put on his flight suit. Second Lieutenant Rasmussen was awarded the Silver Star for his courageous acts in his P-36 over the Kaneoho Bay on December 7, 1941. He continued to serve his country during World War II against the Japanese getting his second victory in 1943. Famously, the Japanese would not launch a third wave on December 7, 1941. However, the 353 Imperial Japanese aircraft, which were launched from six aircraft carriers, managed to sink four of the eight US battleships anchored in the harbour. 2,403 Americans lost their lives that day, and many of them still lie entombed in the ships they sunk with. If you found this a fascinating story just like I have, why not give me a like to make sure it spreads to more people? And if you want to watch some more fantastic stories from World War II, why not check out this video here?